I'd like to introduce our newest sponsor, Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Looking to host your first swim meet or replacing an old timing system? Run a swim meet with ease from your laptop using Superior Swim Timing. You can use Superior Swim Timing with your existing equipment, or they can provide you with a complete timing solution, including deck harnesses, buttons, and starter. SST is fully compatible with HiTech and Team Unify, as well as Colorado, Dactronics, and Amiga touchpads. Go to superiorswimtiming.com to learn more and be sure to tell them I sent you. Nate's come out with another awesome tool for the swimming community. It's called Swim Nerd Live and it allows the data and times from your actual scoreboard to be broadcast and viewed in real time on any smart TV, phone or other device. It has all the information you're looking for, event, heat, lane, name of swimmer, times and places. One click on any device and they're watching your swim meet live in real time. Go to swimpractice.com to learn more. All right, Rocco Merring, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you? Thanks, Brett. I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> now, uh, you you did tell me off camera you're a little nervous, and that's okay, mate. I'm I'm always nervous for these things. It never gets any easier. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't believe you, but anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> so sometimes I get one of these, and it just kind of eases the tension a little bit. You know? <laughs> but, uh, mate, first of all, listen. Um, congratulations on your Olympic success with your athletes. Um, amazing performances uh, from a couple of them. Uh, you know, so congratulations on that. Thank you, Brett. Uh, was a was a mission accomplished. Yeah. Well, in terms of the mission. <clears throat> I want to kind of dig into that a little bit, you know, um, there's, there's always a lot of negativity that comes out of South Africa, you know, in terms of what you guys are doing there, how you're doing it and what you can offer, what you can't offer. And I don't think that's, I mean, clearly it's not always the case, you know, where it shouldn't be a negative experience. You guys are doing incredible things with your back against the wall you know, not as much funding as many other places around the world. And here we are celebrating an Olympic gold medal coming out of South Africa and your program. So like I said, man, I just want to shine a light on that. I think you're doing some incredible work and you're getting fantastic results. I think people would be amazed to hear how you did it. And, and that's what I want to do today. Okay. No problem. I hope I can uh, enlighten you. <laughs> well, tell me this then. Um, you, you, how long have you been coaching where you're at and how did you come about getting the job that you have right now? Um, I've been at the university 22 years now and um, I went and I asked for a job. I actually ran, uh, we got chased out, out of a pool at a school that we used and uh, I went to the university and I asked them uh, whether I could use their pool. At that stage, the pool was not used. It's a cold pool, lots of shade, etc. But that was the only one that was available. And the university said you can use the pool, but you must start a university program. And uh, that's where it all started back in 98, 99. 
And is the, has the facility been upgraded since the time that you took over it? Yeah, they. Um, so we 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 coached in summer in the facility, and then in winter we coached in a twenty meter pool indoors at a at a gym, and then in uh, two thousand and three two thousand and four, the university signed a contract with the swimming federation to start a national training center in four of the lanes. So um, the university then heated the pool. It's a twelve lane fifty meter pool outdoors. Um, so it gets quite cold in in in, in winter, but uh, nothing nothing as bad as uh, as in you know the real northern parts of the world. But it gets cold, and um, they they heated the pool, and uh, we could start training year round. Wow, that's nice. D- tell me exactly where you are located in South Africa. So uh, I'm at the University of Pretoria, which is in the city of Pretoria, uh, which is. Uh, about a thousand four hundred meters above sea level, and it's uh, about thirty or forty minutes away from Johannesburg, which is the uh, the, the business capital of, of South Africa. So it's on the on the northern side of South Africa and in the interior. Okay, wow. So uh, tell tell us about the temperature then. I mean, obviously, how hot does it get in the summer? How cold does it get in the winter? What are the conditions like for the athletes? The uh, the good thing about Pretoria is it's the the city with the least wind in South Africa. So the weather is very stable. Uh, it's got um, it's got a very temperate climate in terms of uh, the winters are, if it's really cold, it's, it's zero degrees, but it's normally between five and eight degrees in the morning Celsius, so not Fahrenheit. And then it gets up to about, I would say, 16 to 20 degrees in winter. And then it's summer, it's... Uh, it's easily above um, 28, 28 to 30 degrees in, in summer, which causes actually quite a unique phenomenon, which means that uh, in summer there's less oxygen in the air because you have relative altitude with, um, with heat. So you get an a altitude effect of 2,000, 2000 meters plus. Oh, wow. uh, and that, that we have most of summer, anything from October october until uh until march wow wow and um how how has the um, political climate been in your area in recent times uh we were not affected as badly as um as some of the other provinces with the um i don't know what you call it with the protest action riots or whatever mm. but south africa is a volatile a volatile country it's a young democracy and um, people from very different walks of life and background and factions and so on. So it is, it is a volatile environment. Um, but uh, you know, you live in the country and you you deal with you deal with the with the situations as they come up. Are you born and raised in the area where you are now? Yep, I am. I've wow. tried many times to get away. <laughs> but um, I've returned many times, so uh, I don't know why. I don't know whether it's a, a voodoo or a doom or I don't know what. But anyway, it's uh, it's it's where I am, and it's a, a, a the uh, it's one of the best environments to coach in in South Africa. Um, I take my hat off to the clubs uh, in South Africa that that survive in much more difficult conditions. So I'm lucky. I I have a I have a responsibility to do something and I have no excuses. So that's part of the part of the fire that that, that keeps me going. And um, yeah, you know, it's a, it'll be a shame if, if, if we don't exploit what we have as much as we can. So the uni- the university pays you as a coach? Yeah, I work as a I work as a sports manager. So my okay. day job from eight to four is a sports manager. Um, the university allows me to coach before and after work, so I'm basically a coach that uh, I'm basically a coach that um, that works as a sports manager. And I'm not good at it, but anyway, I do it. Uh, that that want to coach before and after work. <laughs> That's wow! Basically the situation. So you're a sports manager that part time coaches Olympic gold medalists. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> That's awesome, man! Wow. That's that's nuts. What about the 
the athletes that you coach, do they go to the university there? Yeah. Yeah. So we have a university program. The university is, uh, 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 you know, our athletics director, which, which you would call athletics director, we call it the director of sport. Um, the university has got a very strong um, uh, drive to be internationally relevant and to be uh, a leading university in Africa and to try and do something for the immediate environment and the, and the wider African community. So uh, as sports managers, we are, we are um, tasked to, to, to deliver the goods. You know, we, it's not just the participation program. That's one, one aspect of it, but we are judged by how many, how many athletes do we put onto national teams? How many athletes do we have going to the Olympics, etc.? And according to that, they classify us as a priority sport or as a participation sport. So if we lose, if swimming loses its priority status, we lose the eating of the pool. Oh wow, jeez, there's a lot, lot of pressure, I guess, then to perform. In terms yeah. of sports management, then, um, are you managing other sports? Yeah, I, I manage uh, swimming, men's and women's water polo, triathlon, and the underwater sports, which is basically underwater hockey and life saving. Okay, all right. So, so you're doing the pool management. So you're around the pool pretty yeah. much all day long, then. Yeah, that's right. And and so, what time do you get to the pool? What time do you leave the pool? Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday mornings. Normally, just after five, um, and then um, I finish at about seven thirty in the evenings. Oh wow, man! That's a that's a no, full no, day. That, that that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays. Yeah. Thursdays, you know, the weekdays I finish. I finish at seven thirty p.m. So, uh, Fridays at six, and then Saturday mornings I we we I split the squad in two, and we've got two sessions. So I finish at something like six to ten or six thirty to ten thirty, around about there. Wow. And how many kids do you have in your main group that you're coaching? Um, I'm coaching just over 100. 100? Yeah. Oh, oh my God. So That's is insane. It, uh, is, is that many or is it, I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of kids, man. Holy hell. 100 kids. Do you have assistant coaches? Uh. I have part-time people helping me sometimes. Yeah, I've got. Um, uh, we we are underfunded. You know, it's not a program where I can. I don't have a budget to pay for assistance. So I beg, steal, and borrow. I've I've had a great guy that helped me since October last year. That came from from Learn to Swim. He's very good with technique. So the trade-off was he can learn more about coaching, and um, he can then give me some of his free time and I can learn more about technique from him. And um, that worked very well. He's, he's made an enormous impact. Unfortunately, he's, he's leaving for India now in October. They, they stole him. So wow. we'll start again. Wow. So yeah, I imagine you bring in someone and, the, and they're gone within a couple of years. You, you wouldn't be able to hang on to people like that. Though. So that'd be tough. Yeah, it's a, it, 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 the, the, the program has, has evolved to a point where the seniors run the program very well. So I've got, I've got very good leaders and a culture that, you know, we get on with it. We, 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 we've got to get on with it. We can't, we can't be victims. So if we don't have another coach, uh, most of these kids know what to do. They, they just need to be motivated and disciplined to do it. And, and I oversee the, the program and I sometimes use parents to help me do timekeeping when, when I have to. So um, it's, it, it's, it works as well as it can. You don't seem to be complaining in any way about it, but if, if there was something that you could change immediately, if you, if you could have something different, would you want something to be different or are you you're happy the way it's at? No, I'd love to have a lot of things different. But... <laughs> But uh, I, 
I, I, I was very despondent, and then I left for to work in Canada for two years. I, I had a had a position in in Vancouver as a provincial coach for British Columbia, and uh, I actually realized there how difficult those conditions they, 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 these coaches are under, and how we in South Africa complain all the time and we're negative. And to me, it was a it was a one of those moments where you got to decide what you want, and then you got to you got to get on with it. And um, you know, we think it's 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 rosier somewhere else. I went to visit Dennis Cottrell's program years ago, and I always believed that Grant Hackett has got his own lane and whatever. And when I went to that Miami pool in the morning, and they had athletes and lifesavers and all of those people, and Dennis Cottrell, you know, the energy and the way that 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 guy coached, you realize that's it. It's not the own lane or the whatever. So those things all had a big impact on me. And um, I think to a certain degree, there's a world, there's a way. Right, yeah. And and I imagine that's something you'd have to talk with your athletes about too. I mean, the, the, you're experiencing that as a coach, like, oh man, I wish things were different. But I'm sure as, as athletes too, they're going through similar um, – trains of thought where I man I, I can't deal with this it's just too much so how do you manage to keep athletes like Tatiana and uh, Kayleen in your program <clears throat> and not you know head off to America and, and think well the grass is greener on the other side so I can go over there and get what I need on the other side and now you're producing Olympic finalists Olympic champions out of this program now so what's the process you talk to them about well the first thing is that um we have a very good, we've got very skilled people around us. And I'm at a university, you know, uh, uh, I've got, I've got people that, that, that can deliver a very good professional service, such as physiotherapy or mm -hmm. uh, sports psychology or nutrition and so on. So they form part of the team. I, I do have a very, very good team and a very good strength and conditioning uh, a person that helps me. Um, so the athletes are not stupid, you know, they, they know that this is not mm -hmm. just a, we're not on a sinking ship. And, um, the second thing is I, I, I don't, I don't fight the, the, the people that want to go to America because that's a personal, personal decision, but there are people that don't choose not to go for whatever reason. And, uh, I try and keep it simple. You know, you, you're either a victim, you've either got a victim mentality or you don't. And, right. uh, if you decide that you're not a victim mentality, well, let, let's get on with it. You know, let's not look back. Let's not look around. It is very intimidating for us and for the swimmers when we go to international competitions and you see these teams arriving with fantastic kit and uh, these specialist team staff and so on. But, um, you know, I, I often talk to them about the Kenyan athletes. And, uh, you know, these guys dominate their, their, their sport or their events, and they've got nothing. They've got much less than we do. Right. But but they have intent, and they keep it simple, and they do the basics right. Right, yeah. I love that principle. Yeah, exactly. There, there are many people doing great things with, with very little, and uh, and you have that around you, like you said. Um, you know, not too far from where you're living, there's, there's people all around doing incredible things. So, oh, well, congrats on that. Well, listen, I want to get into the performances a little bit, but I was watching, there's, there's two videos of you on the internet. One's in English, it goes for about three minutes, and the other one's in uh, Afrikaans, it goes for about 30 minutes. I couldn't, I couldn't understand that one, so I had to click on the, the three-minute one. But uh, some interesting stuff you said about the principles of coaching. I just want to talk, to talk about that real quick. I know it's a repeat of some stuff that's already out there, but you say some really interesting things that I think a lot of coaches can learn from. Um, the first thing you said is always be a student of the sport. You know, stay fresh in your learning. What have you done to to do that over the course of the twenty two years that you've been there? Um, I've attended many conferences. I've uh, listened to a lot of content on the internet and read a lot of content. Um, I was lucky enough to meet uh, very smart people such as. Uh, Emma Swanwick and uh, Bill Sweetnam and Wayne Goldsmith and uh, Sean Kelly and you know a, a lot of international coaches that and 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 sports scientists that um, 
that actually gave me the time of day, you know, that would have mm. a discussion with me or answer some questions. I've listened to a lot of stuff that you put out. I think it's a fantastic, fantastic thing that you do. Thank and you. it means a lot to means a lot to a coach like me. You know, I'm I'm isolated. And then, you know, uh, we have a good mentor in South Africa in the form of Graham Hill. He's actually the mm. the the one that showed us in South Africa what needs to be done and what can be done in his quiet, quiet way. He delivered the goods and I've watched him many years and you know, I always thought I'll never be able to do anything like that. But, um, you know, I, I said to the coaches in South Africa, until I actually took the initiative to start talking to him and asking him questions, it's not his job to lift me up. It's my job to to make that connection with him and to get closer to him and to learn from him. And he helped me a lot. Um, so I've... I've always tried to stay, I don't come from swimming, you know, I'm not a famous swimmer or anything, I, I was a rugby player, and um, mm. I happened to get into swimming coaching, and it paid the balls, and I had to get better at it, because I I want to be good at it, so, uh, so I had to learn a lot of things that I think coaches that come from swimming had the benefit of, of knowing inherently, but um, I had to learn it, and um I had to work very hard to get myself to a point where I could actually improve my my coaching offering to the swimmers. Very good stuff, mate. Well, it's admirable that you come from the second best uh, rugby nation in the world. So congratulations. <laughs> <on>. <laughs> just messing with you. Yeah. No, listen, Graham, uh, your, man, your name was just mentioned, Graham. Okay, come on the podcast. Stop avoiding me. All right, you've been called out here. Rocco's calling you out. We need you on the podcast, buddy. Come and share with us. <laughs> He's, listening. With you. He's listening. He's um, listening. Listen, the second thing you said is don't be scared to experiment. Where, did you experiment in this preparation in the lead up to the, the Tokyo Olympics at all? Was there any experimentation done or was that done previous before this? Uh, the biggest experiment was to eventually get Scott Volkers to to it took me five years to get him to talk to me. Mm. Um, eventually he did, and um, a, a big, a huge part of the success of Tatiana's thanks to Scott, um, that I flew out to South Africa and he basically had to reteach me about training. So I would write the set on the board and he would go, no, no, no. And then I'd have to wipe out again. And so I brought him to South Africa three times. And mm. it wasn't for a week or two. The longest was five weeks. And um, to actually understand what he was trying to teach me. And wow. it was it was the best thing I could have done. So if you want to call that an experiment, mm. that's sure. a big experiment for a 50-year-old coach that was mm. set in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And but I wanted I wanted to I wanted to get somebody that I thought had an opposite view of coaching um, because Tatiana is injury prone and mm. I come from volume and from you know all of those things that I think you as a sprinter hate mm-hmm. yep. and I realized you know how much damage I did once Scott was finished with me with I wish I could turn the clock back but I can't. Um, and I needed somebody that could that could upskill me and also teach me about speed. Because mm. I think, in my opinion, sprint coaching is the most difficult thing to do properly. Mm-hmm. And and if you want to get a 200 meter swimmer faster without losing the 200, you know, you, you sit with that constant, if I do this, I lose that. And, uh, and, and uh, Scott, between Scott and, and, and Emma Swanwick in terms of the physiological testing and the feedback i owe them i owe them a incredible incredible gratitude wow that's awesome man you know like you said a 50 year old man stepping out of your comfort zone like that i mean they have all these shows on in america where you know some some guy will own a restaurant the restaurant's not doing well but the restaurant owner has been running it the same way for 30 years and they're so afraid to get out of their comfort zone and they bring this specialist in and he just rips them apart you know and says yeah. no do this do this that sounded very similar to what you were talking about with scott coming in um it is. is is there something that stands out in your mind when when you were writing a particular workout where scott was like no it needs to be 
done this way? Is there, is there something that a philosophy change for you that really um, cl uh, hits home for you? Uh, yes, but I think the, the most basic explanation in that was, you know, I listen to coaches talk the, in their terminology and, and you know, I, I don't understand 90% of what they're saying. And then they started talking about capacity versus power and so on. Mm. And, and, you know, I didn't understand what, what, what is it capacity of what, and, you know, power of what. Mm. And, um, and Scott, Scott taught me, taught me that he taught me that the basically the terminology and then he taught me the the model and then the application you know because it's it's one thing knowing the theory it's another thing applying it mm. and um you know if you're not sure and you're dealing with somebody of of that your honor's uh, ability uh you you don't you don't want to make mistakes one and number two you don't have time mm -hmm. you've got to get it right and we didn't get it right in the beginning it was it took, I think it took about six or seven cycles uh, where Tatiana was quite resistant to this. And, mm. um, you know, I saw the benefit with the rest of the group, but Tatiana was resistant because it didn't make her feel good in the water. Mm. It didn't translate into good results. So I had to tweak it a little bit and, uh, you know, and find my way, find, find a way that, that what, what works for her, what works for Kayleen. Um, but in the process, I, I, I just became, I think, a better coach better at what I'm doing. All right. I love it. It's good stuff, mate. The, uh, the third thing you said there was ask yourself, what is the adaptation I want? And, uh, and, and I would often ask myself this too, like in terms of practice, what am I trying to achieve today? What, what am I getting out of this practice? What is it going to give me at the, when I walk away at the end? What have I gained from this? And that's kind of the same thing you're talking about, right? Well, that's what I got from you when I listened to you last year. <laughs> you did a talk to the to the South African coaches. I don't know if you remember, mm -hmm. and um, it was it was fantastic the advice you gave us. And it was just one of those things that I, as a coach, yeah, that's exactly it. What what do I want? So the way that I get it, the way that I simplify it for myself is is you can't you can't try and stimulate try and have too many stimuli in the session. Or in a block, or the, you mm -hmm. know, depending on what you want to do, keep it simple. What mm -hmm. is it that I want? Mm -hmm. uh, and and making peace with the fact that uh, if that's what I want, I need to understand I'm also going to lose something else, or I'm not going to be working on something else. And I think a mistake I made was you try and be too safe all the time, and you're not prepared to lose something. Um, you want to gain something, but you don't want to lose something. And and, and I'm at a point in my coaching where. Everything comes at a price. You have to prioritize. You have to make the difficult decisions, and you have to you have to have the the, um, the faith that or the trust that that you will have enough time to gain what you feel you've lost. And I experienced it with Tatiana twice this year, which nearly freaked me out. But um, I managed to, not me. By the grace of God, we managed to, to get it right on the day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the fourth and fifth thing you said here kind of relate to each other in a way where it's a lot about communication, picking up on clues and cues um, your athletes talk to you about. But the fifth thing is interesting to me where you said the more talented athletes um, uh, are gold in terms of their communication. Why, why do you mean the more talented athletes in their communication? When I think the ones that are really talented, um, well, I'll start by this. I listened to a, to a very good sports physiologist that said, if, you, if you're dealing with exceptional talent, mm. get out of the way. Right. You know, don't, don't overdo it. Um, so to me, the, 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 the consequence of that is the fact that they know inherently what works for them and what doesn't. And I remember... A couple of years ago, I watched Cameron van der Berg get out in the middle of a set. And I asked him, you know, why are you getting out? And he said, I I've got to get out. My body is inflamed. Mm. And, you know, I thought to myself, how does he know where his body is inflamed? <laughs> how do you know that? But, you know, a guy of Cameron's ability and talent and skill level, they know. So as yeah. a coach, 
you have to you have to listen closely and if you listen to the to the catholic priest that started coaching the kenyans in uh, in kenya uh when i asked him you know what you're a catholic priest you know nothing about middle distance running and you started coaching and he said no but i listened to the athletes they mm. they, they taught me the the, mm. the the feedback that i got from them gave me the direction where we should be going I don't know. Maybe I'm oversimplifying things. No, like mate. Oh, listen, I couldn't agree more. I've had some exceptionally talented athletes. You know, when, when I when I finished swimming in 2006, I, I was really good. I was at the top of my game, honestly. I was I was I was right up there with the best guys in the world. And I started coaching this young kid by the name of Caesar Cielo immediately, almost. You know, from from going from a, a world class athlete to coaching, you know, a young talented athlete. And this guy was so much better than me immediately as soon as i started coaching he was better than me and and, and i saw his talent and I, and I had other talented athletes but we ended up winning the gold medal a couple of years later in in beijing there's no way that if i had have continued swimming for two more years i was going to come anywhere near this kid i mean his talent was so far beyond me and that's what i learned uh, and, and i like to share that too is just most of the time i would just get out of his way like just get out of the way and let him be and and when he communicated something to me, he was so in tune with his body because he was so talented. He was so in tune with it. He could just read it. He could understand. Just like that Cameron Vandenberg uh, you know, story you just told, it's exactly the same things I went through. And I just had to trust yeah. him. And most of the time, he proved me right all the time. And be like, yep, you're right. You're right. You're right. And so uh, it, it's interesting. I, I really like what you said about that. But um I want to talk about Tatiana, but I think one of the most impressive performances that maybe is a little bit overlooked is, is Kayleen Corbett. Is that how you pronounce her name? That's right. Yep. Uh, I mean, what you did with her is incredible. She makes the final of the 200 breast. I think she dropped something like five seconds to go 222 and finish fifth. So tell me a little bit about her, first of all. Tell me a little bit about her, her training. So Kayleen comes from Port Elizabeth, a coastal town. Um, she she went from one one club to the other. Um, so her, her background, um, I, I think, was patchy. The, the coaches are, are very good, but but she wasn't consistently training in one program in one coaching philosophy. Mm. And then when she was eighteen, I met her on the trip to the Commonwealth Games in um, in uh, on the Gold Coast, Gold Coast, right. and she. She came. She she made the final and she swam at two twenty seven. And um, after the Commonwealth Games, she said to me she wants to come to Pretoria and to train with Tatiana. So immediately you said number one with a problem. The kid's grown up all her life at sea level, and now she's going to be at altitude. And um, I don't know much about her background, um, so. I, you know, I thought it's it's a good thing to to bring her to to train with Tatiana. Tatiana obviously wasn't happy about it, but um, so you had that that. Um, what do you mean? Hang on, just stop it. there for a second. What do you mean she wasn't happy about it? Well, you know, she that's her main opposition, and uh, and she's, she's coming to Pretoria, and she's 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 coming to her coach Tatiana. I've coached since she was fourteen, hmm. so. Uh, you know, I don't know whether it's like that in other countries, but in South Africa, the the the, the clubs are you know it's like tribes. You know, you don't know, you don't easily jump from one tribe to the next. And uh, but anyway, so so Kayleen came up here and she had a terrible time. It was uh, I, I I have a more aerobic approach, and for me, aerobic is is below below the aerobic threshold that's a, a big part of the program um of, of my coaching philosophy and um Kayleen was aerobically really not developed mm. at such a low aerobic base i don't know if that's the right word wording mm -hmm. but um it, it it looked to me as though she was better at doing threshold training and and uh swanwick once told me if you do too much threshold training you you, you become mm. like a a car stuck in third gear at high revs and uh, which which was a thing that stuck with me because they you get improvement quickly and then and then you tend to stagnate so right. we had to go back 
into into training with Gaylin, which was very hard for her because suddenly she couldn't swim at the pace that she wanted to to stay with Tatiana, as an example. Um, I also coach the, the the girl that's third in South Africa in breaststroke, and she's two years younger than than Kayleen. So it's Tatiana's two years in front of Kayleen, then mm. Kayleen two years behind her, and then the other girl. So it was difficult for Kayleen from a psychological point of view. Um, but she dropped, I said to her two years, we'll have, we'll have to work two years to try and get you to 2020 qualification. Mm-hmm. And a couple of months later, she swam the qualifying time at sea level. And that was the breakthrough that she needed and, and I needed because I started really doubting whether I can do anything with her mm. because she, she was terrible in training. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, but but Kayleen is a is a unbelievable competitor. At World Champs in 2019, she said to me, I'm going to make a final. And I said to her, Kayleen, you're at World Champs. You, you, you know, just swim your best time in the heats and, and you know, just and, and she made the final. She came eight, wow. and uh, and when that's where she swam two two twenty four zero in twenty nineteen, mm. and then uh, at the Olympics she said to me, "I'm going to make the final." I said to her, "You're eighteenth. You know, get into the semifinals. Don't get ahead of yourself." And uh, again, you know, it just taught me, don't underestimate. Don't underestimate them. They the right ones have got the intent and the ability to do it. Yeah. Well, next time she says to you, I'm going to make the final, say, no, you're going to get on the podium. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. That's awesome. Well, (laughs) and and how's the relationship gone over the past few years? Is it, has it, I mean, obviously look, a competitor is still a competitor, but I'm sure it's probably got a little bit more where they respect each other a lot more now. Right. Yeah. They're getting on well. Um, they compete in the pool, but mm-hmm. a lot of the, 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 I don't know what you call it, the rivalry has mm-hmm. sort of died down. And the other thing is I've, I've split the, I've, I've, I, I duplicate the sessions in the mornings and in the afternoons. So Kayleen and Tatiana don't have to train together. So the same session is, is duplicated because I have enough swimmers to do it anyway. I have to. So uh, I think that the mistake I would have made was to 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 make them compete against one another all the time. That right. would have killed. That would have killed at least one. So mm-hmm. I don't make I don't make an issue out of it. I don't. Uh, very seldom I'll say to them, I want both of you at the pool at the same time, and we're going to do race simulation and and that sort of thing. But that's very seldom. And they, oh, wow. I think in re- in return they they appreciate that. It's it's it's. And remember, I've got the third one as well. So mm. I learned from Christy Wickstrand, an American lady. I don't know if you've ever come across yep. her. Sure. I've learned I've learned so much from that lady coaching females in one day. Mm. She she taught me in one day what, what I should have known for decades. Mm. So I came back from Canada after talking to her and I applied what she taught me and it was amazing stuff. And one of well, the things she said to me, don't do it. It makes the girls very uncomfortable. Don't do what? Don't 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 put them up against one another all the right. time. Right, all the time. It, yeah, it's 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 a it's, it's you're creating a, a a dysfunctional environment, training environment. Sure, but then it creates a dysfunctional coaching environment for you, where you've got to be on the deck all the time. You know, coaching different workouts. I got to be there anyway. So yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm lucky to be coaching two girls like that. So yeah, yeah. Well. I well, they're, they're racing against two girls that seem to understand it. Now, I don't, I don't know the full extent of Lily King and Annie Laser, but it seemed, to me, what I heard was Annie moved to, to Indiana to train next to Lily. She wanted to be around the best, and that's why Annie took off and, and, and is who she is now because um, Annie trained with me for a number of years in, in my program. And then, and then move to, to be next to her. And from what I understand, they do a lot of work together. So I, I guess it's just down to the personalities with women too. You know, there are some that, in, that want that, that want to be next to the best. And, 
and there are some where you have to separate at times. And and look, I've had sprinters, so I understand this. The, the male sprint mentality is very similar to what you're talking about right now, right. where you can't put two lions up against each other, you know, uh, yeah. all the time, you know, and it's, it's a very South African analogy, but it's just like, you know, there's only, there's only one king in the jungle at, at times and you can't, they can't roam around together. So you've got to pick your, pick your spots where you can place them. But um, it, it seems like that, it's still a good thing that they're all under the one umbrella. They're all they're all working enough with each other to elevate each other to to higher levels. I, I would imagine, right? Yep. No, that's a, and it's a very good analogy. What what you're saying. The the other thing is that I think in Lily King and and Annie Lazar's case, they are older, they're more mm -hmm. mature. But right. you know, when I got Kayleen, she was eighteen, nineteen. Right. That your honor was twenty. You yeah. Know, they this they they're a lot different now because it's now four years down the line. Yeah, I understand what you mean. Well, then uh, let's get on to Tatiana then in terms of uh, the success you've had with her. You, you've said you've coached her since she was 14. I honestly, just me personally, I didn't really know her until this Olympics. Like, you know, I don't know every swimmer in the world, but all of a sudden there was this incredible breaststroker from South Africa who was just, competing with Lily King, I, I honestly didn't think there were many people that really could push Lily King. And here we are, you know, from the moment the breaststroke events start in Tokyo, it's like, who is this girl? You know, um, I mean, she was fit. She was fast. She had a, a, a wild technique. And you're going to have to explain this technique to me too, where she, where she <laughs> breathed so late. I mean, I don't understand breaststroke on the best of days, but she really threw it out for me again. You know, I'm like, all right, I, I now I, I have to start from scratch, but, uh, but talk to me about Tatiana then and, and her climb and her process to get to where she got. Yeah. Uh, um, well, Tatiana, you know, again, we we have maybe six to 8,000 competitive swimmers in South Africa. So, you know, the, the kids that stand out, uh, it's not like in, in, in where you're from, you know, there's so many. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, the ones that stand out, there are not many of them. So I watched her when she was in primary school. She came from a three times a week program. She came to our sports school when she was 14. Mm. And um, there was just something about her that, that I liked. And um, coincidentally, Graham, on a talent search thing, uh, phoned me at lunchtime on a Sunday and he said to me, you know, he saw this girl and she can go all the way. And uh, she told him that uh, she's training with me. So, uh, you know, so we, she was identified. Um, and coming from an aerobic sort of background, I did, you know, the only thing I know, and I started, you know, really getting into the aerobic work and so on. And she became, she never wanted to swim the 200, and she started swimming the 200, and she started doing well in it in South African terms. She never made a, a junior national team, um, except one where she went to Africa, Africa Junior Champs. Mm. So it wasn't a spectacular Youth Olympics, World Juniors. She didn't have any, any of that. Um, and, uh, but she's, she's very athletic. She comes from, from hurdles in, in athletics. Right. And she also played netball, which is a, you know, Americans won't know it, but as an Australian, you'll know it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so she, she was athletic. And uh, yeah, she just started getting better and, and, and getting more confidence in, in uh, in an event, and uh, as a teenager, she became the the fastest 200 breaststroker, or the top three among the 200 breaststrokers in in South Africa. So so the confidence grew, and then I left for Canada, and I begged them not to push her for for Rio, and uh, unfortunately they did because I believe the the performance will manifest when it's ready. Mm -hmm. uh, we and in South Africa we push our goals. So at that stage. We couldn't get goals to qualify for the Olympics in South Africa. And there were many, many different um, uh, explanations for it. But mostly, you know, the goals aren't tough enough. We're not hard enough on them, etc. I had a different view. My view was that there's something wrong in our coaching. And because the girls mature faster than the boys, they show us our mistakes as coaches sooner. Mm -hmm. that, that's my theory. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was... I was more cautious with a quality type of training for as long as I could try to stay away from 
from too much of it so that I have that as a training stimulus when she's finished growing and she she now has exploited the opportunity to do more volume mm. at a at an aerobic aerobic level. So she comes from that and I think that has helped her a lot in terms of a, a back end and a, a, a speed endurance. And um I never really tampered with a technique. I'm not a technique fundi. I come from a contact sport, team sport. Mm. Um, but I thought it works. And, you know, why why tamper with it with, when something works? And uh, I remember the coaches were laughing at, at her when she swam her first short course competition. It was actually quite embarrassing. But she came forth as a very young girl. And, um, but, you know, we, we stuck to what we thought works. And, um, and then she lost all her confidence for, for the Olympics in 20. She didn't qualify. She missed it by 0 0.1 mm. at trials. Wow. And she was, she was broken. She was injured. She lost all her confidence. She's a 19 year old. She's first year at university. You know how difficult that year for, for a young, well, young person is. Yeah. And then I returned from Canada. And she came to see me and we, we had a talk. I had a good relationship when, when, when I was coaching her before I left. And I said to her, you know, you need to, you need to, you need to give it another shot. You, you're going to regret not, not knowing what you could have done. Mm -hmm. And we just started again. We started back into the aerobic work. Um, when we took it one, one day at a time, I, I said to her, first, just find your love back for swimming, which is a cliche. But it's very important, mm -hmm. and uh, and no restrictions. And I think one of the things that that was a problem with her was the the coach that she had before was very overpowering. And mm -hmm. Tatiana's got a strong strong personality. She's got very good instinct and a strong personality. So that's something that you got to work with. You got to try and enhance and not suppress, because when they compete, you want them to be strong and express themselves and so on. And then you must want the same when they are training. In, I believe, and uh, yeah, we she qualified for Worlds in 2017. I said, I don't think you should go. I think you should go to World Student Games, which was a good decision at the time. She went to World Student Games and she came second. Mm. And she she phoned me from Taiwan and she was so happy, you know. And the confidence started getting back. And then the next thing that that happened was, she went to Commonwealth Games in 2018. I've never been to those competitions in my life before, so both of us we didn't know what to <laughs> what to expect. <laughs> and she won two goals there. Mm. And you know, then then it was like, you know, wow, oh, that's fantastic. Wow. And then she went through a big through a big dip. Uh, sixteen months of not swimming fast times in training. Uh, you know, trying to apply more of the Scott model. Uh, and she's not feeling good, you know, it's not working for her. And then at World Champs, uh, she went to World Student Games in 2019 and she got two goals. And then she went to World Champs and she got a silver. But wow. she didn't swim well, you know, it was just, she's got that ability to race. Yeah. And uh, and then we came back and prepared for, for Olympics. And I started working a lot on her speed because that's the first time I saw Lily King and Efremova in action and Sydney Pickram and, you know, names like that. And I, mm. I thought, how in the world are we ever going to be able to compete with these people? So when we came back, I knew I had to work on his speed. And thank goodness Scott helped me. Uh, and I had the confidence to institute new things on, on, on speed training. Um, and then COVID came. And we stopped, and then it gave us a little bit more time. And uh, when we raced short course in 20, 2020, she broke the African records on 1,500 and 200. But I, I wanted to see speed-wise, where was she? And I, I saw, okay, we're on the right track. Give us an Sorry, example of that. Then. No, no, that, that, it was all good. I loved every second of it. So don't worry about that. You, you know, you've gone from someone who's shy to talking a lot. So it's excellent. <laughs> we, we love this. The more you talk, the better. Um, listen, you talked about the speed and you just said you, you, she did some things that kind of 
made you feel good. So give, can you give us an example of a speed set w- that she's done that you felt really good about? Um, it, well, it was mostly the, the, the anaerobic uh, capacity sets where we, we try and stimulate the body to secrete the, you know, the, um, the lactate. So, mm-hmm. so it's, it's a passive rest instead of active rest. And uh, it's, it's repeats of, uh, of 25, 30, 35, you know, at max, at, at, at max effort, uh, yeah. I, you know, with a lot of a stroke rate monitoring. Um, and then later on, when we get the body to be able to, to move faster with the faster stroke rate, you know, we try and find the, the right stroke count to balance it. And um, those sets were all new to me. I, I knew nothing about those things. So, uh, you know, that, that helped me and I could see the benefit of doing doing repeats such as those, you know, not exceeding 450, 500, 550 meters per, per session, you know, of, of that sort of work. We, we hardly ever went up to, the, to that full extent. But um, just basic, I think for other coaches, it's very basic what I'm saying. For me, it was new, you know, and it, I, I didn't do right. that before. So... Right. Uh, so that that made uh, fast and uh, another very good experience coach said to me you measure talent by how much and how quickly it responds to the correct training stimulus and i always remember that you know my job is to give the correct training stimulus and the talented athletes will respond quickly mm-hmm. and they will respond a lot and, right. and in tatiana's case i saw that in the lead up from basically trials to olympics um what, what's the weekly work look like in that period of time how many how many workouts a week is she doing how many times is she in the gym you know does she meet with a psychologist like what does the week look like for her so she would do uh monday mondays we would do doubles um mm-hmm. tuesday she would go uh gym swim gym in the morning swim in the afternoon uh, Wednesday we would go doubles uh, aerobic session in the morning just a little bit of recovery from Tuesday Wednesday afternoon would be speed mm-hmm. Thursday would be gym swim and then Friday we would do an aerobic session again Friday afternoons she's got the choice of off or gym or swim she can decide mm. how her body feels. Mm. And then on a Saturday, we do a quality session. So this, the, the quality sessions are basically uh, either a Monday afternoon or Tuesday afternoon, uh, Thursday afternoon and Saturday morning. Right. And then she would do, she would do, uh, she does one oxygen a week where she goes and lies in an oxygen tank, um, which, you know, I, I don't know much about, but she believes in it. Mm-hmm. And, um, she does uh, ozone therapy at the same place once a week, which I also don't know much about. Is that like the way she gets in like a freezer and freezes her body? No, it's not the cryotherapy. It's, oh, okay. It's, uh, ozone thing, I don't know. They put a oh, towel okay. around you and when you get, come out of there, the towel is, I don't know, yellow or whatever. So gotcha. She, she, but, she, but she believes in it. And then, they, you know, who am I to do? And then um, she's got a sports psychologist that she mm-hmm. sees uh, at, when, when she needs to and they have a they have a very good relationship and uh, he's, he's he specializes in golf mostly mm. but you know swimming so he's very technical in in that regard and then uh, she's supposed to see the physio once a week which he sometimes does and sometimes doesn't do uh, for a massage oh so, good, man uh, you, you you offer me a massage a week I'm taking it <laughs> <laughs> Tatiana's not your model athlete, that I can tell you. She's more like a, you know, I, I tell her she, she's like a club player in a third team that wants to, she doesn't want to stretch, she doesn't want to warm up. She wants to have a good time on the field and she wants to have a fight if she's losing and if she's, and then have some, some beers afterwards. So she's, <laughs> but that's a great, she's a great competitor. So Yeah, good for her. Oh, well, listen, you have to be. You, you take on a girl like Lily King, uh, and even uh, Annie Laser, I mean, you better be a competitor because those girls will eat you apart. And not only that, um, was she racing great competitors? I mean, I mean, she she dominated in a way. Like she didn't win by a touch, is what I'm saying. That 200 breast, she broke the world record. She swam faster than anyone's ever swum. So 
did you know that she was on that kind of pace before? Were you, were you not expecting the world record, but could you kind of feel something was going to happen before this thing ha uh, broke? Yeah, so uh, when we when we started moving into into more race specific training prior to trials, um, that was around January, February, uh, more mid January, uh, February. Our trials were early in, in April. Mm -hmm. She was already swimming first times. She mm -hmm. was pushing. She was pushing thirty threes, thirty fours, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then she swam two twenty point one at trials with with no competition mm. and uh i and, and um, I, I said to her before trials she asked me how do i think she would do them i said i don't know because you know how do i know but the trend the trend is showing us that you're going to be fast mm. uh so i said to her but i want you to be at or under world record pace at 100 and i'm even 50. if, if that's where you are in, in in beginning of april then then we're on the right track and uh, she was, she was, she was a 144 at 150 meters at trials. Mm. And, you know, that was unknown territory for her and for me. So then, then we decided we're going to do the same training program leading up to Olympics. We've got the same block, same training program. And with that, with that program, when we were starting to do times and so on, she was faster. Right. We never spoke about we never spoke about the world record, um, but she saw and I saw, you know what 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 she was on. the The only time we spoke about the world record was in twenty eighteen of the Commonwealth Games. I said no, sorry, in twenty seventeen of the world students, she wanted to give up for a while, and I said to her, "You can break the world record. You're walking mm -hmm. away from." Because I believe that that stage she she was she could do it. I just needed to do a better job as a coach. Oh. And uh, in twenty in twenty 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 when COVID came, uh, I said to Tatiana, in twenty twenty one in July, whether it's on the moon or whether it's in Pretoria or whether it's I don't know where at the Olympics, but you're gonna go for the you're gonna go for the world record. Mm -hmm. If the Olympics is happening or not, it doesn't matter. You're gonna go for the you're gonna go for the world record. Wow. Well, it's nice to have a coach that instills that belief in their athlete too. I think it's important, you know. You don't want to talk about it like you said very often, but it's nice for the athlete to know co coach believes in me in, in that respect, you know. So that's a big deal for her. Um, you know, like I said, it's one thing to, to think about beating Lily King. It's another to actually do it. She looked relaxed behind the blocks to me. She looked in control. It didn't look like the event was too big for her it didn't look like her competitor she wasn't swimming in lily's lane like lily did her thing the first 150 lily went and and it even surprised me what the way she attacked that race it didn't seem to phase tatiana it seemed like she was in control and that last 50 i mean i watched it right before i did this podcast with you here i mean she just took off and it was like she had full control um it was just a very well orchestrated timed 200 breasts do you do you feel like it was a very complete race for her that one yeah it was yeah. we 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 practiced it we 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 knew what lily king could do um and it wasn't only about lily king but i mean she's such an amazing swimmer that you can't you can't be arrogant and think well okay we're not worried you know, we we knew what Lily King could do, and uh, and FMOVA. I was I was worried about FMOVA, and I was worried about Pickram swimming and, and others that I didn't know of. You know, so but Lily King is is a champion, and she's a winner, and she's a she's tough, mm. and I have a lot of respect for her. And uh, it was a big highlight for me to meet Ray Luce and, and talk to him. Uh, he's such a amazing coach. So, uh, but you know, we we got to go in with a plan, and. Uh, uh, we plan we planned the race and the time so that we could be competitive and we were aware very well aware of what what chaos and destruction Lily King can cause in the race moments before that just go back for a sec you know I'm thinking to myself like okay um I know the way it turned out it's it's incredible but moments before that like 
I've been in positions like this at the Olympic final and the nerves you feel and the anxiety and then to be coming up against kind of the US juggernaut, you know, you've got the, you got, like you said, it's a fully back team, fully staffed. You walk into the environment and you see 60 of these people standing there all in the same uniform and, and it's like, it's, it's daunting. Were there any moments leading up to maybe the hundred breast or the 200 breast that you felt the nervous tension was there any moments like that? I was I was sick. <laughs> <laughs> I I was I was broken even before before the Olympics. But uh, it's not about me, you know, Tatiana. Uh, I, I try and keep a pen face and, uh, and and and. But Tatiana is a is a is a very um, devout Christian, and uh, she's got a very strong foundational base of of you know how she lives her life and what 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 she believes is an issue for her and what's not and mm. uh as i said to you she, she's like a third team player in a club team you know she she couldn't care less as long as she's having a good time and she still gets something out of it you know whether it's enjoyment or making friends or whatever she, she's actually a little bit um how would I put it, naive or juvenile about about mm. the whole thing. And um, and it could just be because it was our first time. You know, we were like, we, <laughs> we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what to think. We didn't, you know, we just knew that we got to swim fast and we have these amazing people that we that, that she's racing against and uh, you just got to give it your best shot. And, and she honestly is one of those that if people don't appreciate me giving my best shot, then it's their problem. I don't carry the weight of the world on my shoulders and uh, I don't have to prove anything to anybody, which is amazing. It's it's actually very refreshing. And it started to cascade over to Kayleen as well. Right. And, and I guess that's probably how she was able to back up after the, the 100 because she was the fastest qualifier going into the 100 and, and didn't end up winning the event, but it didn't seem to phase her going into the 200, you know, I kind of had these fears that, oh God, she's in lane four again and, and the pressure is going to get to her in some respect, but it didn't turn out that way. It, it was, so she wasn't completely devastated by losing the hundred is what I'm saying. She was happy. I was devastated. <laughs> but, but if you, if you asked us a week before the Olympics, would we, would we like to be on the podium for a bronze medal in the hundred? I would have begged you for it. Mm. Uh, when, when she, broke the Olympic record in the heats, you know, it changed the whole, you know, and then greed and, and all of those things come into play. But um, so to me as a coach, I gave her the wrong advice. I told her prior to the race, you got to make sure that Lily doesn't get away from you mm. because the longer she gets away from you, the more confident she's going to be. You got to make sure that you stay with her. And Tatiana's stroke count was out. She was, mm. you know, she was slipping. She knew that, and I knew that. And and I apologized to her afterwards. I said to her, I gotta get that off my chest. I, yeah. I gave you the wrong advice for the race. I maybe gave you the right advice with regards to Lily. But you know, they, we we learned a good lesson. There's another there's another six girls out there that also want to win. And also yeah. they're also tough. So yeah, hats off to them. And we we moved away from it. And uh, you know, that was it that was dealt with. So, going into the 200, I never got the impression that she's, that she's overly nervous. I think she was so confident because of so many reasons. But, but one of it was we really had a good, good preparation in terms of mm. times. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and she, how can you not be confident if you, if you swim these times at altitude in training? Right, and that's that. I that I feel is my job as a coach. That that that's my job is to is to create that that confidence. Well, listen, mate. It takes a big man to admit that. I've I've made that mistake myself a couple of times. So don't worry about that. I think as coaches, we all want it desperately. And you see, sometimes you see the competitors at their strengths, and you're like, just be aware of that. And and that awareness can take you out of the awareness of where it really should be, and you end up over swimming the race a little bit and then having a little bit of regret but man listen it's it's very common i wouldn't beat yourself up on that and and to still come away uh with the with the silver you know 
pretty nice. Um, but, uh, it, you know, Bob Bowman said something interesting to me in terms of his own um, feelings going into Michael's races, you know, when there's a lot of pressure on Michael and how he wants to turn up on the pool deck. Did you have moments back in the village where you had to kind of talk to yourself in the bathroom before you went out and get on the bus with, with your athlete or anything like that? Like kind of slap yourself around a little bit, you know, the nervousness, the sickness that I you was, feel? I, I was really sick. I was, I was, I was nauseous. Yeah. So I, I had to take some there. nausea medication and I thought to myself, I'm the biggest wuss in the whole world because I'm sitting there. But you know, it's it's well, <laughs> what can you do? You sit there, you gotta you gotta pretend that you're all cool and you know everything's under control meantime. Yeah. yeah. But you know, that's that's just uh, I don't know. That I'm glad to other coaches feel like that. I thought it's only me. Oh no, mate! Listen, many a times <laughs> I wanted to throw up <laughs> before I speak to my athlete, and then you have to pretend that you're super cool and super confident. Um, don't worry about it. Uh, listen, you you did say South Africa is tribal, and um, there's obviously not a lot of funding, and you've had incredible success. <clears throat> so with all of that, uh, are you going to experience some jealousy here? Are you going to experience kind of like? people working against you within your own system? Are you fearful of that now? Um, no. Uh, I'm a normal coach as any other coach in South Africa. And they know it, and I know it. and <laughs> So I would be very surprised if anything, if anybody... Um, yeah, I don't know, threatened or I don't, I don't know what the right word is. But anyway, I'm I'm a club coach and uh, I have a lot of athletes that I'm not successful with and seasons that are not going well, and like any other coach. So I was lucky to have Tatiana cross my path and I learned a lot from her and Kayleen followed because of her. So I'm lucky. I, there's, there's no other way to put it. And, and in return... I have a responsibility, like any other coach would, to deliver them the best possible coaching that I can. So there's, there's nothing to be jealous about. Any any other coach would do the same if they were the, in the same situation. Yeah, I agree, man. Maybe it was a terrible question. I'm sorry I brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, what about this in terms of the funding? I know there's some issues with, with funding in South Africa and, and, and um, some, some money, some prize money, things like that. Has some of that stuff been sorted out now? Uh, so the incentive money, mm -hmm. the issue about the incentive money that was in the media, the private sector jumped into the, into the rescue and they did crowdfunding and they actually came up with quite a substantial amount of money that they gave to Tatiana and our surfer that that, um, that won a silver at the Olympics. And uh, as a coach, I got some money, which I'm very grateful for, and the surfer's coach got some money. Mm. So, uh, and and I think the, I think, you know, how do you know whether the government is lying? They, they you know, they retracted and said, but we never said there's no incentive money. Mm. But the, the converse is also true. They never said there is. Mm. So uh, I think what, what happened was the public opinion was so um, so much mm. that the government then came up with, with, with money, which they will incentive money, which they will pay. So that's the, that's the incentive part. With regards to the financial support, it's no secret. Uh, the financial support to the athletes... Uh, to the Olympic athletes in South Africa was basically zero. So somebody like Kayleen doesn't get one dollar from support from anywhere. So if it, it's the university and benefactors that, that keep Kayleen going. And uh, with regards to Tatiana after Commonwealth Games, she got some sponsorship, which we're very grateful for. And with incentives built into her contracts, breaking Africa records, South African records, etc. She managed to save money and that could keep her could keep her campaign going until until Tokyo. Until uh, Paris. 
or oh, in Tokyo. Yeah, but what uh, what about now? Is she talking about Paris? Does she want to continue to keep going? Um, yeah, it seems as though she wants to continue. Uh, she's only recently, she, like in two days ago, she returned back from from her break. She went abroad to to Holland to visit her parents. They immigrated to Holland in January, oh. and. Um, so, you know, I didn't talk to her beyond Tokyo because she's 24 years old. She's finished studying. She's a professional swimmer. Uh, I felt she will tell me when she's ready. And I think in her mind, she had to see how does it, how's it going to go to Tokyo? You know, do I continue swimming? Do I stop? Mm. Do I stay with a coach? Do I change to another coach? You know, that's, that's her right to, to make that decision at her time. And the worst thing I could do is try and force the issue. So she she returned, and she we will have a conversation in next week about the way forward. Um, but I respect the fact that you know she's got to make a decision that's going to work for her going to Paris. There was never any talk of um, swimming ISL for her or your there other was. athletes. Oh, there was. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. We uh, we. We had to, we had to unfortunately decline ISL three times. The what do you mean by time, unfortunately? Because of COVID situations? Uh, because of COVID uh, was was a, a big thing last year because Tatiana and I were asked to be on um, on Team Iron, okay. which w- was a big honor for me. Um, uh, it would have given me a chance to work with Joseph Naji, you mm-hmm. know, which would have yep. been a dream. But the COVID. COVID, the risk was just too high and, and we had to make a difficult decision. And then this year, uh, Tatiana needed a break after the Olympics. And, yeah. and you know, ISL being happening because she 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 really needed a, she really needed a complete break with lots of things that also parents immigrating and so on. So she had some personal things that she also had to just get a release from. Right, for sure. Does this gold medal uh, change her life substantially, you think, or not? Her life. Yeah. Her life. Yeah. Does it change her life substantially? Yes, it does. Well, that's. It a, does. That, I mean, that can be a good thing, right? Fantastic. It's it's amazing. It, it definitely. I would hope it changes her life substantially. Yeah. For the better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully, it opens up more opportunities for you guys as well, and. Um, well, maybe yeah. I should ask you that does it, is it does it change a, a champion's life for the better or not? I don't know. I haven't coached one before, <laughs> yeah, I th- for sure. Like, it, it certainly depends on what country you're at, the, 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 depending on the level, you know, and, and how often, um, you know, it happens in that country. Like, in the US, maybe not, you know, like, uh, maybe Lydia Jacoby for sure, maybe you know, she's from uh. Alaska, Alaska. Um, you know, may, maybe that situation for sure, but uh, maybe someone else in the U.S. Maybe not, but um, certainly if you if you win a gold in Australia, it can certainly change your your life. Uh, you know, for Cesar Cielo in Brazil, hundred percent. So yeah, I would imagine, um, you know, for someone like Tatiana, she should do well off this. So you know, yeah. I, I hope it does. So that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah, yeah. no, she will. Yeah, good. Well, listen, mate, um, it hasn't been too painful to share like this, has it? Uh, no, well, I, I'm very honoured and um, humbled by you asking me to, to be on your show, so thank you very much for that. Honestly, mate, there was an overwhelming um, number of people requesting you, to be honest, you know. Uh, I, I put a, a, a little thing out on social media the other day asking for, you know, who do you want to see next? And overwhelmingly people were asking for you so there, there's a, a huge amount of people that want to hear from you and uh so i appreciate you doing this and um and and just to get to know you man uh, incredible story the work that you put in is just in, insane uh, i can't even imagine the the effect that it has on your personal life all the all the work that you put into this to to get this result but congratulations on it man you deserve it and uh, i wish you the best in the future okay Thank you very much and all the best with your show. Thank you for it. Thanks, Rocco. Take care, mate. Bye. Keep well. Bye-bye.